G'day viewers. In this segment we'll talk about reference models, which give us a way of organizing protocols. Okay, so now we know about protocols and layering, good for us. But what we still don't really know is which particular function should be implemented in which protocol. If you think of a function such as finding a path through the network for routing, should that be implemented in a higher layer protocol or a lower layer protocol? We don't really know yet. So this is the key question. Um, and it's, it's a major question for designing any network. It's, it's probably the largest question. Well, there are actually no definitive answers because which uh, layer, in which layer to place a particular function is a matter of experience as people design networks. But we do have something which will help us out. The reference models I'm about to describe provide us with guidance to tell us uh, which layer it is, uh, you know, often valuable to place particular functions. So here is uh, one famous reference model. It's called the OSI seven layer reference model. Now um, this is a principled international standard effort. It's all about providing a, a reference model that will allow systems to be interconnected. Uh, systems made by different people, that is, different manufacturers to be interconnected in a way such that they'll all work. It's been tremendously influential. It was actually put together by uh, know a standards body in this is probably all the 1980s but even though it's hugely influential it's not really used in practice um, oh well in fact I'm not even going to tell you what OSI stands for because you don't really need to know okay I'm just kidding I'll tell you open systems interconnection is what it stands for just in case you're asked um, but this standard is really an influential one rather than what's literally used in practice let's go through it you can see that there are these seven layers here at the lowest layer is what's called the physical layer. The function of this layer is all about being able to send bits across some physical medium like a wire. So that's going to involve sending signals. The layer above that, the data link layer, is about sending units of information. Here they're called frames, but the point is they're not mere bits. They're now closer to the message we care about. On top of that is the network layer. That's about sending packets across multiple links. It sounds suspiciously like the data link layer, but its scope is broader. Now we might talk about sending packets across multiple networks, as in the internet. On top of this is the transport layer, which provides different kinds of end-to-end -end delivery services, such as reliable delivery, for instance. On top of this, then, are uh, another couple of layers that are a little different. The session layer manages task dialogues, it says here. What that really means is bringing together many different um, components that are used in a related way together. Uh, so that they can be manipulated as one. Uh, for instance, an application might use many different connections across the network, all in service of the single application. The presentation layer is about different representations for information, uh, different file and image and video formats, for instance, uh, because many applications can communicate using different kinds of formats for the same uh, inherent content. And finally above that is the application layer, and that's really what we think of as applications. They provide whatever specific functionality is needed by users. So this is the OSI 7 layer model, and you're going to want to remember all of the different layers of that model. But I'll tell you now, what we mostly use in practice, um, and particularly in the internet of course, is something called the internet reference model. This is a four layer model that's based on experience. In fact, in some ways it's the opposite of the OSI model. The internet began to be built and you know, whoever implemented pieces that worked, well that's what became the internet. The model was really uh, fashioned out of it, abstracted out of it later on, just to try and clarify what was going on. And it really drew on many of the ideas from the OSI model, which had a brilliant model, but no implementation of protocols that anyone really cared to use. So you can see that there are some differences compared to the OSI layer model. We really uh, omit some of the layers and the, instead of a network here it says internet. The internet layer is the key uh, replacement for the network layer and the internet uh, layer is all about the IP protocol. So if I was to number this, going from the bottom up, uh, we start with the link layer. Its purpose is to send uh, frames, these units of information across links. I'll call this layer um, 2 and uh, 1. Uh, because really compared to the OSI model, it, it's uh, often performing both of those functions. On top of this, the internet layer is really a replacement for the network layer, 3. You'll often hear network and internet in the same breath in terms of layering. The transport layer is then layer 4, it's providing services on top. 
And people might uh, talk about layer 7 as the application layer. That's what it was in the OSI model, layer 7. And you can see here we're missing the presentation and session layers, which actually are uh, not normally present in a layered structure. Uh, presentation and session functions are useful notions, but they're often provided by libraries and they might not be explicit in the protocol, layered protocol structure that's used in networks. So here we have it, we have the Internet Reference Model. Let's go a little further and look at what we can do with this model. Um, actually, I mostly want to relate it to the protocols you might have heard of. Now again, just to clarify, a reference model is a framework for describing what protocols perform what kinds of functions. It's not actually the protocols themselves, so we need to put different protocols in different layers. And you might devise new protocols in your career, who knows? So what kind of protocols go where? Well, at the internet layer, guess what? It's the IP protocol. It is the main instance of a, a protocol at the internet layer that we're going to use in the internet. Transport layer protocols, you might have heard of TCP, and uh, there's something else called UDP, which transfers information without reliably, without reliability. Whoops, my writing's a little off there. Um, these are two protocols which are used here. Now, on top of that are various applications. Applications here are really things that use the services of the network. We might have HTTP, that's used for the web. Other things, RTP is used for real time. Um, SMTP is used for email transfer. And uh, maybe something even like DNS. And there are plenty of others, I'm just sketching a few examples here. Okay, below IP we have different kinds of uh, link technologies which are used to combine different systems. This is, you know, different kinds of physical medium, if you like, that we're going to use to connect different nodes. So we might have, uh, well, it's 3G cellular, Ethernet, uh, I'll write DSL and cable, just as different kind of physical layers that you plug into, and even 802.11. Okay, let me clean some of this up a bit. Oh, I mostly chose the same protocols, that's good. Now I've drawn it in this fashion to show you that IP here is the narrow waste of the internet because uh, if, the, if we always use IP as a standard reference for the, uh, for, the, um, for the network layer position here, as we do in the internet, then we're able to uh, use a diversity of different technologies below and a diversity of different applications above. And we can change any of those new uh, link layer technologies or any of those new applications and transport protocols. And we would expect to be able to interoperate across all of these systems because we have a common layer in the middle, IP, which is the narrow waste of the internet is providing connectivity between all of the diversity below and all of the diversity above. So this is really, this uh, narrow waste using IP is at the heart of innovation in the internet. Okay, let's see. Oh, here's the other thing you might be interested in. And this is just where on earth all of these protocols come from. Um, we, we will see many examples of protocols in this course. And there are many more that are out there which are used in practice that we won't even have time to go over. So who's making all of these protocols? Well, the answer is different standards bodies are making these protocols. And the reason they're making it, what they really care about is interoperability. There's making a standard so that different manufacturers of a device that performs some function, such as playing video over the internet, will be able to operate with one another. This is good for all of them uh, because it increases the size of the market. You don't want uh, to have incompatible technologies that do the same thing. It promotes standards wars. So uh, the focus here on these standards is on interoperability. In fact, the focus is not usually on how to do a good job of implementing this standard at all. Uh, that's really left to companies and whoever can do a better job there has a competitive advantage. So this can lead to strange things being left out of standards actually uh, because information that's going to help you do a, a good job in terms of performance need not be specified. So I can show you some examples of different uh, standards just to tell you about it. There are different bodies here. In the telecommunications area there is a body called the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, specifies a lot of telecommunications standards. Examples here are things for like our ADSL, your DSL link used at home, the MPEG-4 standard, which is used to compress audio and video and widely used, is actually in the ITU standard. These uh, standards are often called letter standards. You can see the G dot and the H dot, that's the, actually the the uh, official name for that standard. It's not called a DSL, it's called G.992, for instance. There's another body, the IEEE, the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers. 
Um, and this body produces standards in the communications areas by different working groups. The most famous of its working groups is the IEEE 802 working group, Project 802. And that's produced many standards of which you probably used and are familiar with. We all know uh, Ethernet and Wi-Fi, at least you probably heard those terms. This is actually 802.3 and 802.11 standard. This is why Wi-Fi is sometimes called 802.11. That's the name of the standard for Wi-Fi, whereas Wi-Fi is just the, the common garden variety name. Then there's a body called the ITF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. This body produces Internet standards. And these are sometimes called RFCs or requests for comments. So there are many different RFC numbers and they specify standards that you might have known, that you might know about. Uh, for instance, uh, here's a, an RFC for the DNS. There would be other RFCs for things like TCP and IP, for instance. And finally, I'll mention the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. That produces web standards, not surprisingly. So things like uh, the HTML5 standard and the CSS standard. This is about the content over the web. Actually, the protocol that's used across the internet, HTTP, is specified as part of an RFC. Okay, so now you know a lot about standards. Um, I, what I want to do now, just to finish out this unit, is to talk about something else we get from reference models. And that is the structure of the reference models often gives us some names and terminology just to talk about networks. In fact, a lot of the names we use to describe units of data take their names from the layering. Um, if we're talking about units of data at the physical layer, well, typically we're talking about bits is what we're going to call information at the physical layer. If we're talking about the link layer, we'll often be talking about frames of information. The network layer is where packets exist. And uh, the transport layer, a unit of information at the transport layer is actually called a segment. And there's a generic term for applications and everything above that's message. So uh, different layers technically have different names for groups of information. Nonetheless, I want to point out that packet is, can either be used in a very specific way, meaning the network layer precisely, or we'll often use this just in a general way as a form of convenience to refer to a unit of information that's going over the network. It might more properly be called a frame or a segment, but often just for the sake of convenience, um, I'll call things a packet. And you'll have to work out from the context whether it's actually a frame or a segment. Layer-based names are also used for devices in the network. Now, uh, here I have a device that's called a repeater or a hub. It works like this. You see this picture shows that it performs processing at the physical layer, but it does not touch information at any higher layer. You might also have heard of devices called switches. A switch operates at the link layer, so you can see here that it connects different instances of a link, typically with the same technology, and that's how they can be connected together. Whereas a router operates at both the, it operates at the network layer, so it's able to take in and connect um, instances of different links. So this might be 802.11 and this might be Ethernet. And this is how the router was able to connect different network technologies by, by connecting at a higher layer, the network layer. And we can go up even higher. Here we are. There's a variety of terms just for things that uh, operate inside the network to um, provide connectivity and relay messages between devices, yet they look more highly than the network layer. So they might look into the transport layer or even the application layer. These are variously called proxies or middle boxes or gateways. They're actually strange devices in the middle of the network, not at hosts. Hosts, of course, need to process these layers. I'm really talking about devices in the network here. Now, the reason this is all important, these names are important, and that you understand your layered diagrams, is all of these boxes just look exactly like this. I mean, they're just different kinds of boxes. You might be able to recognize a particular kind of router or switch if you're used to working with them, but if it's something you haven't seen before and it's a box, you don't really know what kind of processing it implements inside it. Um, if you can find out, well, these diagrams and these uh, particular names tell you the kinds of processing that can exist within different kinds of boxes. And finally, to finish out this segment on layers, I want to tell you that layers and with our reference models are really a guideline. They're not strict. In fact, you might have multiple protocols operating at the same layer, and there may even be cases when a particular protocol is difficult to assign to a layer. It might not neatly fall into our different kinds of layered framework here. In fact, this is a lot of the, um, the complexity and the fun of networks. 
uh, that you might have protocols that don't neatly fit in here. So don't just assume that because something sits on top of a network layer protocol, it's a transport layer protocol. That's not necessarily the case. Um, nonetheless, our overall layered framework will prove valuable just for thinking about the functionality and roughly what's going on at every layer. Okay.